everybody. Um, it's an old dream of mankind to control the environment and to control others with thoughts. And um, with the new methodology in brain science, as you have seen from the previous speakers, that old dream comes at least a little bit closer. I'm not saying that you're realizing that dream. I just show you a few first steps in that process of realization. So the idea, as I said, is an old one. The idea is that we use what's coming out of that brain, what's the basis of our thoughts, use that activity, which usually is electric, but it can also be metabolic, synaptic, chemically. Use that activity. And with that activity, we drive an external device, a machine, computer, or we put that activity into other organisms and change the other organisms by, by activating them with our thoughts or with our emotions. And our thoughts and emotions are nothing else than electrical changes as you have heard before. So I give you some practical examples of these first steps of the application of these neuroscientific methodologies. Uh, it, it not only shows what could be done in the future therapeutically, it also shows the enormous capacity of our brain to regulate its own activity. The capacity, I mean, that's what we call in, you know, in everyday life, the capacity to control ourselves, the capacity to control our thoughts, the capacity to control our emotions, which sometimes we can, but most in daily life, most often we do, and we do very effectively. And I think this is another good example of what the brain can do in order to change itself. Now, when I read this uh, uh, short sentence for the first time from a Swiss philosopher named Ludwig Hall, I thought this is a pretty trivial statement, and not worth of a philosophical discussion. Now, you will see now in the, when I show you some of patients who cannot communicate anymore, demonstrate that this philosopher of command uh, is, is even more uh, uh, important than you would think when you read it the first time. Now the patients we work with are patients who have neurological disease which end in complete paralysis. When I say complete paralysis, I mean complete paralysis. That's what you see here. This is a patient who cannot move his eyes, he cannot, there's not a single muscle in his body who can be voluntary controlled. But his cognitive capacity, his thinking capacity, his emotional capacity is completely intact. And I, I, I can't tell you exactly how we do the, how we, how we diagnose that. That's, that's an old story to diagnose whether somebody in that state is cognitively intact. But that's possible with neuroscientific activity. Now these patients, of course, cannot communicate anymore. None of their wishes, none of their you know, ideas, none of their thoughts. Now here you see the probable solution, or one of the solutions to that. Which is, this is one of these patients. So these patients, usually they have amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, which is a disease which destroys all the motor apparatus from the center to the periphery. There is no muscular output, nowhere. But the inside of the brain, and as you have heard before from Kevin Stock, the inside of the brain is mainly an apparatus who communicates with itself. The inside of the brain works fine. So what you see here, go back again just to explain it. What you see here is the brain activity of these patients. These are implanted electrodes, but you don't have to implant the electrodes in this case. We have to implant them for different reasons. So what you see are the brain activity. And his task is to say yes or no with his mind. And he did, he did that, he learned it to just imagine a hand movement and a foot movement. And a hand, imagine a hand movement, or it mean, meant yes, and imagine a foot movement meant no. So what you see here, this is just for you, he cannot see, he's blind, but what the up, when, the goal, when the upper goal appears, that means yes, that was wrong. And this ball you see flying over the screen, that ball is exactly the brain activity of many, many electrodes which when it hits the goal means that he did the right imagery. It means he said, this is wrong. So he couldn't say yes in this case. So when you look at the end of this long learning procedure, then you can do the computer at least, 
Oh, also you with your eyes, if you just look at the color of the two pictures here. One is yes on the left side, one is no on the right side. You can discriminate it with your eyes, and that means when you can do this with your eyes, the computer can do it even better, because uh, as Elan says, the mathematics of this is the critical is the critical variable here that you find an algorithm who is able to discriminate these two states and then uh, uh, deduct what the patient uh, was saying or saw saying. Now you may think it's not worth it and many of our colleagues, at least in Europe, I think in Israel the situation is not as burning, but in Europe people say, what are you doing here? This is not worth doing. You know, the quality of life is miserable in such a state. And it's better to let these people die than to give them additional hope for communication with such a device. To respond to that argument, um, we tested in many, many studies, I'll just give you one example, the quality of life in these end state types of disease in complete paralysis. And the overall, not only us, other laboratories did that too, and the overall answer is very clear. Quality of life after a while in that state is as good in a healthy person as in, a, as in a paralyzed person. So there's no difference in quality of life. But when you measure quality of life, when you measure the judgment of quality of life, of the environment, of the family, of the doctor, of the personal, judging the quality of life of the patient, it's always bad. So we think quality of life in such a state is bad. When you ask these patients themselves, it's quite normal. So how do you ask them this question? Well, with that brain-computer interface, it's an international, it's a, there's a questionnaire, which has some standardized questions, and then you ask, and, and you ask them in that way. Now here you see this is the same principle. By the way, this is, um, the whole machinery is built by two Israeli firms, startup companies, one is Neuronics and the other one Motorica, and they built this device. So this lady has a severe young lady, had a a strong, severe infarct on the left side of her brain. Basically, the left side of her brain is completely gone. And now she tries to move the hand, and as you see successfully, by imagine the arm movement of the completely paralyzed arm. So she imagines that movement. She gives the command to move the arm, and that command is transferred to that machine. The command from the brain is directly transferred to the machine. And as you can see, within the first session, she's able to move this completely paralyzed arm. Of course, you have to train her after many, many, many sessions of this training. You have to train her to generalize this capacity out from the laboratory in the, in the reality. And that's a real difficulty. So the technology works very fine, thanks to the Israeli minds who constructed it. But uh, the, the, the psychology of the problem is still unresolved, uh, as Carl also mentioned in his talk. Now finally, let me go to emotion. So what I showed you so far is the first steps in the reconstruction of communication in people and patients where there's no communication or no motor output possible anymore. Second, the reconstruction of movement. And you have seen, at least for simple movements, we can reconstruct it directly from brain activity, even without implanting electrodes. Of course, if you implant electrodes, uh, uh, as, as, as Al Gal and, and Kevin showed you, and, and Ethan showed you, implanting electrodes to signal is always better and you get a better result. But for most patients, implantation is not possible and they don't want it for different reasons. So let me finish with emotions because Gal gave such a brilliant introduction to that field. So the question, by the way, uh, the emotional reptilian brain was invented by an anatomist and not by a psychologist. But now you know that I'm a psychologist. <laughs> I'm defending my, my professor. But it doesn't matter, he was still right. It's a stupid idea. <laughs> uh, okay. Now these are the brains on top. You see your brain, I hope, you, and on, on the bottom, I don't go in between. On the bottom, you see the brains of criminal psychopaths, mostly murderers. And these people are waiting. An, an aversive event here. So they, they, they develop, they should, normal healthy people develop anxiety in that situation. It's an anxiety provoking situation. And as you can see with your fresh eyes, if you look at the yellow and red colors here, is that these people on the bottom, which we call criminal psychopaths, these people have a completely quiet brain in those areas where in healthy people you see some change. 
Okay, that, that is related to the incapacity to anticipate anxiety, to anticipate the consequences, the emotional consequences of what they do, and the emotional consequences, of course, what they do to their victims. We know that since many, many, many years. Now, cognitively, they are completely capable of anticipating what they do, but the emotional areas who should be activating to experience that anticipatory anxiety, that areas are completely silent. And I say silent, I'm not saying they're dead, and I'm not saying that they are dysfunctional, and I'm not saying that they're not existing or shrinking. I'm just saying they're silent. The reason why I'm saying they're silent is because you can wake them up, which I show you in a second. How to wake these silent areas up? So what we do, we put these people in the scanner where the, brain, the metabolic activity of that emotional brain areas is recorded, as Carl described to you. And we not only show them the activity in that brain area, but we show them the activity in, the whole, in that whole circuit, which is responsible for creating anxiety in an anxiety-provoking situation. So the patient looks at this, at this uh, picture here, and his task is only to increase the red and reduce the blue. And if the patient does this, the, the red is completely dependent of the activity of this circuit, which is creating anxiety. So what they do, what you do in that situation, usually, you try all kinds of strategies, emotional kind of strategies, to move that cursor. And healthy people, within 20 to, 20 to 25 minutes, are able to do this. And as you are able, if I ask you, you know, imagine hate, imagine love, imagine, imagine your, your husband, imagine your wife, you are immediately capable of doing this. And that's the same thing here. So the better you do this, the more this thing moves up. So after a few, as I said, few sessions, you can do this. Now these are the brains of this criminal psychopath you saw before. And we train, in this case, we train them to activate an area which uh, God already showed you shortly, and that's an area which is called the insular area, which is responsible for the guts of the emotion, which is important for the, the physiological ingredients of, the, of an emotion. And as you know, an emotion depends very strongly on the signals coming out of the body. So this brain area allows you to experience the body, the body correlates of your emotion. And as you can see, even this criminal psychopaths, all of them are able to increase the activity. And after doing this, and you present them an anxious material, they tell you that they feel now anxious. They feel anxious in, in, the, in the presence of this, of this material. That doesn't mean I would let them out of the prison where we did that. <laughs> I, I let them in quietly there, because I don't know whether this will hold for a long time. This is just a, just a few hours, you see. We haven't really tested that. OK, to summarize, what I said, this is the overall picture of the criminal psychopaths. They need much more than you do. They need about 11 sessions to do this, and we need about, or the non-criminal non -criminal psychopaths, they need about two or three sessions to do this. So they're not as good as us, but they can do it all. <coughs> to summarize this, let me finish with an old Yiddish saying which says, which means I'm mad of hope. Thank you very much.